you've got a patient with chest pain, this is their ECG. What does this ECG make you think? I'll get you to pause the recording here and then I'm going to talk you through it. So this ECG demonstrates some of the changes that you might get with a pulmonary embolism. Things that I want you to notice, we've got a right axis deviation, we've got ST and T wave changes, particularly we've got T wave inversion over in these right sided leads, and we've got the right bundle branch block pattern with an RSR in V1. We've also got that S1, Q3, T3 pattern, okay, so we've got an S wave in lead 1, a Q wave in lead 3, and an inverted T wave in lead 3, so S1, Q3, T3. So whenever you're interpreting the ECG of a patient with chest pain, one of your differentials should be pulmonary embolism. And what's the most common finding on the ECG of a patient with pulmonary embolism? Well, it's sinus tachycardia. It's also probably the least specific finding. The pain alone might be enough to cause a sinus tachycardia. There are some other findings though that are a little bit more specific. Right axis deviation might point you towards pulmonary embolism, a right bundle branch block, a right ventricular strain pattern, so T wave inversion, an ST depression in V1 to 4. The S1, Q3, T3 sign, that gets talked about a lot, but I should point out it's not sensitive or specific for pulmonary embolism. Atrial tachycardias like atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter that can present as part of pulmonary embolism. And it's also worth noting that a normal ECG is present in 18% of patients with a pulmonary embolism. So just because their ECG is normal doesn't mean they don't have a pulmonary embolism. Certainly if they have some combination of these things, you're going to be more likely to go investigating.